applauded by leadership. We see this happening in the church at Corinth. And it has happened in churches to this day. Rampant sin. And, and we're going to get to a situation here in Corinth where a guy's sleeping with his stepmom. And Paul says, this is the kind of stuff not even the world would think is good. And yet it's happening in the church. And I'm telling you folks, I know this horrible kinds of stuff happens in the church today. And it happens among leaders. Uh, thirdly, if there is a major portion of a body fighting with one another. And we're talking about a, a, a point at which a church is going to split apart. Those might be times to go to a trusted individual who might be able to join with you in prayer or even know others that could affect a positive change. So Paul says there are quarrels. And it's, a, it's a, another Greek word that's kind of interesting, and it, and it means to wrangle. I always picture, you know, wrestlers on uh, whatever the acronym is now these days. Um, WWMV or something? No. WWE. <sighs> WWF. <laughs> Ty, whatever. <laughs> the professional wrestling uh, with a little P. Uh, it can, because it, it, it suggests uh, it suggests rivalries. And, you know, that's what you always see on those shows, right? It, it's always, that, that's how they always build it up. It's always some guy who's got a beef against somebody else and they're going to take it out in the ring. And, and uh, of course, it's non-scripted and, and uh, every move is a professional wrestling move. Kids, don't try this at home. Uh, anyway, but, you know, we can do that with each other. There can be these kind of rivalries, these quarrels that take place where the, the quarrel itself might have been over something really small, but we've built it up into this kind of Hatfield and McCoy thing. And if you guys don't know my reference, study history, Southern United States. <coughs> Report back next week. Uh, and and uh, these, these quarrels were getting so serious that the body was being threatened with destruction. And so then Paul, in verse 12, he gets into the meat of it. Okay, here's what I'm talking about, people. Members of the congregation had basically been allying themselves with one particular teacher. And then there were those who were above it all, and I follow Christ, you little minions out there. You don't know what you're talking about. But it was in this way of kind of putting themselves over everybody else. So what's the deal here? The, you know, the odd thing about it is that you know, they, one of them says, I, I follow or I'm with Cephas, which is uh, meaning uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter. And as far as we know, Peter had never even been to Corinth. So how are they going to say, I follow, I follow Cephas, if he hadn't even been there? Well, here's one possible explanation, and I think it's actually kind of illuminating. That basically these people were falling into groups uh, according to either their culture or their impressions. For instance, some said, I follow Paul, or I'm with Paul. Uh, Paul was a, a Jewish Gentile. He was, he was a Jew, but he was born in Gentile country. And his charge from Jesus was to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so the Gentile Christians in Corinth would have had a real affiliation with Paul, who was a Roman citizen. So they're going, I'm with Paul. Peter, on the other hand, was a Jew. He was born in Israel, and he was, uh, uh, we know he even ran into a few problems now and again with, with being a little bit too Jewish and not being quite free enough to be Christian. But the Jewish Christians in Corinth would have very comfortably fit in with Peter's lifestyle. And then you had um, Apollos. Apollos was one of the most effective uh, speakers that the church knew in those early days. He was a uh, 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 person who could provide a defense for the gospel and he could present the gospel in a very forceful and dynamic way. So here's a guy that's pretty impressive. He's one of those guys like, yeah, Apollos, he's my man. If he can't do it, no one can, or something like that. Oh, where did that come from? But you can, and, and so then you, you can kind of see how the, the people are starting to fall into these, into these camps uh, by their cultural affiliation or by their impression as Apollos with a, as a great orator. And the, the Greeks were very impressed with, with great public speaking skills, so it's not surprising at all to think that. So what it points up is the, the tendency for groups to break up into schisms based upon those they perceive as their leader. 
And this is how we fall into pastor worship. And how does it come about? We, one way is that we more readily identify with someone that we can see or hear or can see and hear about rather than an invisible Lord. It's much easier to follow a person that's standing in front of you because you don't see the Lord. He's not here right now. Uh, we also tend to be closer and affiliated to people that are like us. And we tend to be suspicious of them that ain't, if you know what I mean. And, you know, humans, you know, as human beings, we are competitive by nature. And so, left to the flesh, we will naturally drift into groups that will begin to compete with one another. And then finally, we are enamored by nature with leaders who are dynamic, focused, and polished. Basically, what I say is it's surface over substance. You got to really watch out. Somebody can put together a pretty slick package that looks, sounds, smells, and you know everything else like it's just couldn't is too good to be true, and sometimes it really is. Now that's not to say that just because there is a large ministry that uh, this is taking place and there's pastor worship happening. It's one of the reasons why uh, I really like the role model, role model that Pastor Chuck has set for us as pastors of Calvary Chapel. Very rarely do you, do you uh, meet a more humble guy. Uh, I, I've had just very few opportunities to spend time with Chuck uh, alone, and he is just the most humble, down-to-earth, relatable guy that you can imagine. This is the guy that founded Calvary Chapel, and there are thousands of them around the world, and millions and millions of people that are part of this fellowship. But uh, on the other hand, there are many ministries who are simply created around a dynamic, polished individual. Now. He goes on in verse 13 to say, Is Christ divided? Was it Paul who crucified you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? He's pointing out to them the ludicrousness of what they are doing. Because it appears as if Jesus Christ himself has been split. There are those that uh, through, down through the years things have developed so that if you go to worship on a Sunday, which you all are right now, I warn you, you can be going straight to hell. And there are others who won't fellowship with you at all or consider you to be saved unless you have been baptized into their church and their belief system. And I'm telling you, no wonder the world is confused about the gospel. Because what we have done is we have layered our culture and our preferences on top of Christ. And people have to delve through all of this other stuff that has nothing to do with the gospel itself in order to get to the root of the fact that we're all sinners and Jesus saved us by grace. We are saved through faith, not of our own. I mean, it's, it really can't get a whole lot simpler than that. But we have just put all kinds of stuff on the top of it. Our uh, strange interpretations of Scripture sometimes, our, our justification for our particular behaviors, which then leads us to interpret Scripture strangely. And then when we find leaders who support this, maybe even encourage it, we just follow them wholeheartedly and then the world goes, what are you people about? <laughs> Is Christ divided, Paul says? Heaven forbid! And he says, was it Paul who was crucified for you? Paul couldn't have been crucified for them. And no pastor or leader can do anything other than just be a reporter. Jesus did it all. So he goes on in verse 14. He's, he's dictating this, remember. This is a dictation to Sosthenes. Remember, this is a letter, so it's, Hey, Soth, take a letter. And so he begins speaking. This is Paul talking, and Sosthenes is writing down in Greek as fast as he can. Now, I don't write Greek characters very well, so he must have been better than me. He says, I think, you can just picture him pacing the room, right? And he goes, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you have been baptized in my name. And then he's, then he's thinking a little bit, and he goes, well, I, I, I did in fact baptize the household of Steph, uh, uh, Stephanus, but beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anybody else. It's almost like, it's not important, people. <laughs> So then he gets to the 
the, the, the point. He says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with clever words, so that the cross of Christ will not...